open your Bible, will you, and meet with me in the book of Jude. And we're going to consider the first four verses this week. Now, before we begin, I want to remind you of something that's so important, that Scripture stands in authority of us, over us. We, we don't stand in authority over Scripture. And therefore, what a tragedy it is if we ever take a view with the scriptures of eisegesis, which basically means that we're inserting our personal opinions into the scriptures. In other words, this is what it means to us, and therefore that's the most important thing. What does these scriptures mean to me? It's where you have a narrative, you have a paradigm, you have a worldview, and you use scripture and distort them in order to fit your personal opinion. And what a travesty that is. No, no, we take an exegesis view, not an eisegesis, an exegesis. In other words, uh, the Spirit of God is working within these authors of the Bible, 40 approximately, of 66 books. And the, God is using their intellect, their personality, their hand to convey his message. And so we don't want to read our meaning into the text, but we want to extract meaning from the text. Okay? That's, and that takes hard work. Without a doubt, it does. And so we want to know, what is the original intent of the author? How did the first people who read, in this particular case, this epistle, best understand it? What are the divine truths that God is communicating to us? And how do we take those divine truths over the theological bridge of time and best understand how to apply these truths in the, in the days in which we live? And I readily admit it's a lot easier as, as uh, Christians here in, the 20, in, you know, in 2021 to be able to relate more to the New Testament than the Old Testament without a doubt. But the principles remain the same. And so I want to tell you that. Because Jude has an overarching message. This is epistle. It's 25 verses. It's quite often overlooked. And there's probably, you know, they're not good reasons, but there's probably reasons for it. Maybe because of its size, maybe because of its location. You know, here you are, you're in John's epistles, and you say, let's just jump right to Revelation, because he also wrote Revelation, and we just skip right over Jude. But maybe also, too, if we're honest about it, is Jude is a difficult epistle to read because it speaks about God's judgment. It speaks about the wrath of God that is to come. And that makes us feel very uncomfortable if we're honest about it. And I think Jude personally, and I have to I'll admit this, that Jude, and you always have to be careful that when you read scriptures and you go, oh my goodness, um, these scriptures fit my paradigm perfectly, my personal beliefs. You always have to be careful about something like that because you can be falling into the traps of eisegesis. And I will tell you straight up that Jude's epistle really, really speaks powerfully to me because Jude reminds me of Matthew 24. Jesus says, listen, there, in the last days there'll be uh, prophets and teachers who will lead many astray. That um, as lawlessness increases, the love of many will grow cold. And, he, and Jesus tells people that you must per persevere to the end in order to be saved. And that's what you see in Jude. And that's why it strikes me so much. And also, you can find the same thing in the Hebrews writer where he says, what shall become of us if we neglect this great salvation? Or you can read it in Peter's first epistle as well, that there's this call to stand firm, to be alert, to be on guard. And Jude is doing that as well. Well, let's just begin with verse 1, shall we? Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Well, who is this Jude? Well, it's the half-brother of Jesus, and he's the brother of James. That's how we know that. And uh, we see in the Gospels that uh, Jesus' brothers are actually named, and Jude is one of them. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? He calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. He's humble, isn't he? This is much different than when Jesus was here on his earthly ministry, where his family were very concerned about him. Undoubtedly, when uh, Jesus was surrounded by so many, his family couldn't even get to him, you know. And his family was there. Why? Because they were concerned about him. I wouldn't be surprised when we get to heaven and we talk with Jude, he'll say, yeah, yes, I, 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 my, my big brother, Jesus, uh, I viewed him as a Jewish carpenter. I didn't view him as a teacher or as a prophet, certainly not as the son of God. And I was concerned about him because he, he was claiming to be the son of God. He, he was claiming to be, you know, before Abraham, he was. And, and, and we couldn't understand it. We couldn't fathom it, you know. 
We 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 thought he he had gone insane because I knew him as a Jewish carpenter, and now here he is, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. I th- I think it's quite remarkable. I think we just must step back and consider that for a moment. And if there's any doubt on who he is, well, he's the brother of James. To those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. What do we see? We see God's election. And what should that cause then? Confidence, called assurance. Not confidence in our flesh. Not confidence in our testimony, our our degree of repentance, or, or our works, or anything of that nature. No, no. But confidence in God. In God's power to save his people. We are called We are beloved in God and kept for Jesus Christ, right? Jesus said, all that the Father has given me, you know, I'm gathering them all up and no one will snatch them out of my hands. That should give us assurance of all people who've been born again by the Spirit of God. That as in Romans 8, right, we cry, Abba, Father, why? Because because we belong to God and God belongs to us. His Spirit testifies with our spirit that we belong together. And therefore, we have mercy. God has compassion. We have peace. We've been made right with God. And the love be multiplied to you. That we, we reread in the scriptures that God indeed is love. And because we have been born again, regenerate people with new hearts, new affections, new desires, we no longer long for the things of this world. We no longer for sin that makes us lawlessness and and where love grows cold, but now love is a blazing fire. We have a new explosive affection for God and for one another that God's love now pours throughout us because we are new creations in Christ. And he goes on to say in verse 3, Beloved, although I was eager to write you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write an appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What is he saying here? Well, the best way that I can understand it, Jude is saying, hey, I wanted to write you 16 chapters of Romans like Paul did. I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. But I don't have time for that. Something is happening that I need to bring to your attention right away. So I'm, I'm, I'm pinning this epistle to you because I need to get it to you right away because I'm concerned about you. That's what he's saying. And I think it's so important to recognize that he says our common salvation. So this idea that Apostle Paul, you know, has, you know Apostle Paul's Christianity is way up here with Jude and, and with Peter and, and with John, you know, and then, then here I am, you know, my, my Christianity is something less than that. No, 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 no. Paul makes the same argument in Romans. No, our faith is the same as Jude, as, as the great Apostle Paul. It is the same. Oh, I admit in terms of knowledge and in maturity, Yes, depending on uh, uh, when you come to the Lord and there is a sanctifying effect and there's a growth to it by absolutely, but it is common salvation. We are all one in Christ. So the, this idea that there's the backsliding Christian and then there's the regular Christian and then there's the super Christian. No, no, there's just Christian. You are either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. There, there is no in-between, and this is a common salvation. And Jude says, listen, I long to write to you about our combat salvation, but I needed you to contend for the faith. And this is the tragedy. I go back to Matthew 24. I, I go back to when Apostle Paul tells Ephesus, he said, listen, there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing that are going to come in to try to lead you astray. The church will implode from within, not from outside. When, whenever the devil tries to persecute the church, all it does is it expands the gospel. That's all it does. The way that the devil can make the church ineffective is by, by an inside job. It's by having men and women creep within the church to sow dissension, to lead people astray, as Jude is going to show us. And that's why he's saying you must contend for the faith. There are those who profess Christ as Lord, they're professing Christians, they appear to be on the narrow path, and they're not. 
And the example I would give you is in Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian comes to the cross, his burden has been removed, his garments have been replaced, and he leaves the cross on his way to the celestial city, he immediately comes across three characters, three pilgrims, if you will, but they don't seem to recognize that they have chains that are locked to their heels. And, they, and Christian finds him asleep, and he's aghast by it. And he says, listen, men, wake up. Wake up. There's a roaring lion. You are acting like you're, ma- you're, you're sleeping on mask on a ship, and there's a raging sea beneath you, and you don't even seem to recognize how easily it is for you to fall off this mask into the sea and to never to be, uh, to be just pulled down, never to be seen again. You know, what is Christian saying to these three guys? Hey, you got to contend for the faith. Oh my goodness, look what's happening to you. And Simple says, wakes up and says, well, I don't see no danger. And Slothful says, well, you know, maybe there is some danger, but let me sleep a little bit more. We've got time. And Presumptuous says, hey, you know, every vat rests on its own bottom. I mean, I was like, going, well, what, a bunion, what are you trying to communicate here? And basically what it means is each man, woman, and child stands on their own. In other words, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. And this is such a tragedy. Again, I go back to this. We're, we're looking at scriptures. We're reading our meaning into it. We're more sure of ourselves than our facts. I see it everywhere. People are more sure of themselves than their facts. We become presumptuous people, slothful people, simple people, self-righteous people. We, we lack self-awareness. And, it's, and as a result of it, there are many, perhaps you yourself, you will never make it to heaven. Because the opposing force that is working against you is going to win. Why? Because you're so self-assured in your own thinking. And that's a tragedy. So when Christ says, those who persevere to the end shall be saved, that applies to everyone else except for you, right? When Christ says, hey, there are false teachers and prophets that are going to lead you astray, well, that, 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 you know, that doesn't apply to you. When the you know at the love of many will go cold as sin increases, you don't see the coldness within your own heart. It doesn't apply to you. You're simple, you're slothful, you're presumptuous. And Jude is saying to us, now listen, you must contend for the faith. Now why, Jude, why? Well, he tells us straightforwardly in verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for the condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So what is the grace of God? Well, that is the gospel message. And I want to remind you, what is the gospel? What's 1 Corinthians 15? For Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. That indeed is the gospel. You find it in Colossians where where, uh, Paul says, listen, we were we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive. We were under the just demands of the law, but 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 our our sin uh, was nailed nailed to the cross. All right, our debt of sin was nailed to the cross. That indeed is the gospel message. That is the good news. But these people pervert the gospel of God, and this is how it's perverted. And I want you to listen very closely to me. So, what some people will say, well, like these people here, this is the gospel. You've been saved by Jesus Christ. He's given you his righteousness. So therefore, you can keep sinning. Go ahead. Keep sinning. Because Christ has done everything for you. Therefore, keep sinning. That is the normative in the Christian life. And they totally forget Romans. They totally forget Romans 6. But they say keep sinning. Well, for most Christians, they're going to go, I know that that's not right. I know that's not right. But then here's the second one that may appear to sound right to you. So there's another view that says, this is what the Christian life is about. You stop sinning. 
You want to be a member of this church? Stop sinning. This is the things you need to do. So therefore, stop sinning. That's what the Bible says. Stop sinning. Sin no more. That's what the Bible says. Well, no, that's not what Christianity is either. The mistake that we make is the Bible says something more than says sin no more. It says that, right? <laughs> the examples. But the Bible says something more than that. Okay? So if you're only sharing the partial truth, then it's not really the truth. That's called legalism. So keep sinning is antinomianism, and legalism says stop sinning. Well, what does the Christian, uh, what does Christianity teach? Well, Christianity teaches because you've been uh, born again in Christ, says you've been freed from the power of sin. And you find this in Romans 6, where um, the uh, apostle uh, Paul is saying, he says, listen, in verse 11, chapter 6, so you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And he tells you why in the next verse. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. Sin no longer reigns in your life anymore. You're aware of it. I mean, I completely agree. I think it was Luther who said that the Christian life is a life of repentance. As you grow in holiness, you'll see more and more of your sin. Undoubtedly, that is true. But why is it that you see it? Well, because you've been made alive to God. Sin no longer has dominion over you. There is a sense that when a Christian sins, he's, he or she is choosing to do so. So you've been set free from the power of sin. It no longer has dominion over you. You're no longer dead in your trespasses. You, oh, you do have the ability to oppose your sin. You do have the ability to be sanctified by God's word. You are now devoted to God. Not only are you set apart, Okay, but you're devoted to God. And because you're devoted to God, there is this new life that is within you. All right? All right? And so therefore, sin no longer reigns in your body. So what is Christianity? Is it is the Christian message keep sinning? No, that's heresy. Is the message stop sinning? No, that's called legalism. No, it, the Bible doesn't teach that. It says that, but it says something far more than that. And this is the best way to say it. Christian people have been freed from the power of sin. That's the truth. That's what we need to come to. That is the gospel message. It is not an intellectual endeavor. There is an experience that when one comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God resides within us. And these people come into the church to get people comfortable in their sins, to stay in their sensuality, and tells them to keep sinning. And then you have people who want to lead people astray and say, okay, now stop sinning. As if Christianity is some type of teaching or morality or ethics. And of course, I'll say it again, of course Christianity contains those things, but Christianity is something far greater than that. You must not stop at that. And then they also deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, they deny that. They don't come out and say that, but they deny it by telling you to keep sinning, by telling you to stop sinning, by, by, by never coming to the truth of realizing, in Christ I have been freed from the power of sin. And so you say, no, but John, this isn't happening. My friend, it is happening. Read Ligonier's Theological Annual Survey, and it shows among evangelical Christians believing that there's more than one way of salvation. You see? We're slothful. We're presumptuous. We're simple. We keep reading our own thoughts into the scriptures and what a tragedy it is. Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, he didn't mean it. Christ says, you must persevere to the end in order to be saved. Jesus didn't mean it. There'll be prophets and false teachers to lead you and I astray. Oh, the Bible didn't mean it. Jude is telling us, as Bunyan was telling us in Pilgrim's Progress, 
We need to wake up. This is an inside job. The church is imploding from the inside because we're denying, we're becoming practical atheists is what has happened to us. That's how Sinclair Ferguson put it this week when he was being interviewed um, at the Ligonier's conference. His greatest concern is we're becoming practical atheists. And so Jude is saying to us, listen, contend for the faith. There's much more to be said and we'll spend probably a good, um, another at least two or three messages on this book of Jude. Uh, just a message that is so important for us to hear. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here for this week, just so that we can meditate on these four verses and what Jude is telling us.